cat. I brought the dog today. Oh my oh, god. Lord. All right. Hold on. I think everyone is probably going to hear us soon, but we uh, have to wait to it see. Says we're that. live. Yeah, but the the link to, it hasn't streamed. It takes like it's like a thirty second lag. So. All right. I know, but everybody, can, this is what they see. They see this beautiful slide. Um, nice. It's going to be amazing. Okay, so we are we're like actually live, you guys. We're like live. On nice. Weekend. I know it worked nice. this time. Oh my god. Okay. We should, we, we don't, so I also don't know if it's going to show us who joined because it's going to be on the LinkedIn. So if it says zero. That's not okay. true. They're all over here. Uh, every, okay. To, our, to our, our, our five followers, thank you very much. Very exciting. <laughs> nice. Okay. Hold on, Lisa. Let me, let me pull you guys up. So, Lisa, I know you're very excited the government didn't shut down. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely happy, but it doesn't look like it's going to stay not shut down, which is the other sort of downside. Um, what a mess, though. What a mess. I mean, this is well, a real was- argument for the great private sector, as you would say. God bless America. I was talking to a bunch of Canadians earlier and, uh, and, and they think that we might be screwed. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can totally blame them, but at the same time, what is the defense plan for Canada? Just out of curiosity, who are they going to depend on? Okay. So, uh, so the Canadians, uh, I feel like everybody knows what I'm talking about. They also do always say it is nice sleeping next to the world's superpower. So, you know, whatever, that's, that's fine. Right. Anyway, that's right. uh, anyway, I'm excited for the government to maybe shut down again in a few minutes. So that's fine. Um, but yeah, so other things that happened, you went to Arizona. I, oh my God. where did I even go? I went to DC. I went to interesting person dinner. Um, but we had something else really exciting that's, uh, supposedly happened in, uh, Arizona. Um, yeah. your colleagues dressed up like Star Trek and Star Wars at the Contexture annual meeting. It was pretty great. So I, I was, I was, I was honored to, uh, to keynote the Contexture Future of Health Data Summit. I gave a little talk, um, talked about the amazingness of health data utilities. Uh, I think I did a pretty good job, honestly, if I'm just going to like, you know, uh, rank myself. And I was thinking about all the keynotes I've given this year, Kat. There's a lot of them. Well, that's Started because out in Alaska. you are fantastic. We've talked about that. Everybody wants you to be their keynote. I hope that they're paying you money for it. Yeah, well, not any money quite yet, but maybe at some point in the future. However, I started out in the great state of Alaska, one of your favorites. That is my Keynoting favorite the Alaska HIE Summit. And then I keynoted the HIMSS Interoperability and HIE Forum. I want to say that was in Chicago and then the Contexture know. Summit. No, but, but here's what's coming up. The Middle East HIE Summit at the end of October, beginning of November. And I will be there. And if any of our lovely followers want to come, um, I'm sure you can still register in Dubai. See you there. This is Sadie. If you don't know, Sadie. Um. Sadie is 11 years old. She is a poodle chihuahua mix. This is we have a, have a dog every every week, so this is the dog for the week. Sadie. Oh yeah, we did have a dog last week. That's true. Dog of the that's week. True. Yeah, that's right. awesome. Well, well, so um, I'm sorry. We were still in the middle of hearing you talk about all your amazing keynotes that I don't keep track of. Do we? Are yeah. there more? Are there more? Are there more? I think that's it for the year. Um, I'm not really sure, but thanks everyone for hosting me in all these various places and all those Marriotts. I'm happy to all those Marriotts. I've seen oh all the Marriotts. Goodness. Amazing! I love all the Marriotts. Well, I was at uh, I was in DC this week. I threw an interesting person dinner. Right? Uh, it was very interesting, obviously. Uh, but what I'll say about interesting person dinner that was super cool and why Lisa, I like you why I like you and why I like our very special guests who are waiting to uh, to be on our TV show um, is, I don't know if you guys know this, but Lisa's a like a democratic socialist. Like, I don't even know what that is. What is that? I don't even know. I, first of all, I don't have any political affiliations. I am so left of center that I'm right of center. It's just a complete Amazing. circle here. Amazing. Just a okay. full bipartisan, nonpartisan, whatever. But I am from Northern California, so make your bets. Yeah. Take yeah, your bets. Not, Place your bets good. if you're going to Vegas. It's not good. It's not good. Uh, <laughs> but, but I don't know if, if, if anyone knows this, but I'm this thing. I'm like this really rare um, political animal called a moderate. 
I know. But the great thing about Lisa and I and me is that um, is that we uh, often disagree and she often will call me and tell me I'm stupid or I did something wrong. True. And like, I feel True. like I do that too, but in like, maybe not as a legit way for her. So, True. but we have interesting discussions. And so the interesting part of interesting person dinner is that we had a lot of different people sitting around having different opinions and like everybody kind of got along. And I was like, God bless America. This is, we are truly free. Right. So it was cool. Uh, we had people who loved him. I mean, isn't that the dream, Kat? Isn't that the dream that you can just like I mean, decide to agree to disagree and have a discussion and nobody gets shot after dinner? It's good. Uh, well, that is true. Um, but no, so you made me listen to a So Lisa and I listen to podcasts every morning. And Lisa mostly supplies all of my news in case anyone didn't know. Um, but you sent me a podcast this morning, the, um, oh crap, what's it called? The Brain One. Hidden brain on perfectionism. Hidden brain, it's hidden amazing. Brain. Yeah, and it was about perfectionism, and I listened to all that, and I was like, perfectionist. I can't even understand how that works. But at the end, Lisa, there was a one of the they do the other little skits they pulled from another show, and it was unsung hero or whatever. And they were talking yep. about it at the very end. It was some like psychologist or someone fancy. The um, unsung said, hero of the week, which is a feature of the podcast for years. Yeah, it was. Wonderful. Yeah, it was. I'm sure I wasn't listening to the part that you actually wanted me to watch. Uh, or listen to, but <laughs> at the end, because I was thinking about like, oh, it's so awesome to be able to like disagree and like not suck. Um, but they said at the very end, this woman was saying like her goal is to get uh, to get people to understand that they can make other people feel heard without changing their mind. And I was like, oh, oh my God, that's I nice. just feel like we've kind of nice. lost that. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, but you should check out the perfectionism podcast show. Uh, it was pretty great. It's so. really good. It's we'll put, we'll put it in the link. It's basically the hidden brain podcast and they have really great topics around cognitive science, which is what I studied in college. And they bring in people every week. And this week was about perfectionism and all the research about perfectionists and that why you wouldn't want them to be, for example, flying an airplane, flying. Yeah, you don't want to be a pilot. You don't want to be a pilot. And don't you don't want, want to be a pilot. To- do high nope. stress, crazy things. Cause they'll like bomb out. Nope. It won't work. Won't be good for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Not but anyway. Fair. Okay. So that's like our warm up. I don't know. We have some exciting things. Okay. So we have, we have let me lot. tell you who we have coming. We have coming. We have a lot of people coming. Lisa, Lisa didn't actually know who all was coming until maybe 20 minutes ago, but that's fine. She's best on her toes. Uh, so we have, <laughs> we have Carrie pie coach who is, I don't know if everybody knows this is, but it's kind of like our friendly mm. neighborhood healthcare technology conspiracy collector. She's going to maybe tell us what conspiracy she's collected this week. Uh, then we have Natanya Wachtel who is going to give us an actual legit briefing on psilocybin and like what's going on there, which is interesting and unique. And she does a lot of this fun wellness stuff. We're going to let her talk about that. Uh, we have Marie Kupolos. She's, she's not here yet. I hope she shows up, but she is very interesting Lisa, you'll like her. Because I think she's you, coming. I think she's coming. She checked in I think already. She, I think she'll be here. I don't know. If, if not, like it'll be like it'll be like last week. I think we got the LinkedIn thing working, so that's good. But, we did, uh, but she, we did. she's exploring the intersection of climate and health, which is like totally rad. I don't know if you guys know this. I live in a red state, so we don't have climate change. So when she sent me some op-ed about climate change and health, I was like, I don't even know what we're talking about here, you know, but, uh, but it does seem legit. So you're in California, Lisa. So you can tell us if, if, if everything is, is cool. Yeah. And fine. Yeah, totally. yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So we got, we got Carrie coming here. Hold on. Let me see. I got to do this thing here. So Carrie. Hey, Carrie. Carrie, we can't hear you. You got to oh, mute. Oh shit. Carrie's on the mute. Hello. Hello. Da, 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 da. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> so Carrie, we, we got you this slide. Check it out. It's right. So so Carrie, we'll make Carrie introduce herself here. But for those of you who don't know, Carrie yeah. is the mastermind behind the world famous award winning, maybe a Q Hins aren't real campaign. I would give it an award just to be clear. <laughs> yeah. <I>? Yeah. <laughs> um, Sadie gives it an award. Awesome. Well, pause you know. <laughs> So, you know, thanks for having me, Kat and Lisa, on your first official talk show. This is super cool. And I love it. Second the- official, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, first on LinkedIn. We didn't make it on LinkedIn last time. Oh, man. <laughs> but I love conspiracy theories, especially about government. I've worked for two state governments, and often you hear these things like the government is tracking you. If that were the case, why do I have to tell them how much I need to pay in taxes? Like, right. Exactly. Both of the state exactly. and federal government. Amen. <laughs> why do I have to like 
<laughs> so, and I spent a lot of time thinking about public health and Medicaid. And while I was working in public health in Alaska, you know, TEFCA, all these acronyms came up. And for the epidemiologists and those working in the field, they're, they're like, so what? <laughs> like, how does that solve problems on earth today? And that kind of led to this idea of QHINs and QHINs not being real. Uh, I was presenting at ASTO. It's a long acronym that I won't talk you through, but they're focused Association on Association of State and, and Territorial Health Officials. Health group. I got it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and so I had the privilege of presenting on a panel with ONC and the CDC who did their beautiful acronym soup. And they knew about this ahead of time. And I'm like, I'm going to give some state perspective. And I, you know, part of this, I got to work with Max, who's Kat's relative to create this graphic as, and t-shirts because you got to get, get people's attentions. We were in the basement of a data conference. Like you got, you got to really raise the bar here. And so I, I talked about my work in Alaska and New York and in Colorado. And I said, you know, after hearing ONC and CDC present on TEFCA and QHINs, how many of you actually know what they're talking about? And do you think it's real? We had <laughs> maybe a couple people in the audience. And it was it's intended for a dialogue. I believe in science. I believe in ONC. I think that TEFCA is an important real? piece of... <laughs> yeah, but that's the question. Like, are and when they're real? Um, the last couple of things I'll say: um, this has become now a panel on the Sequoia project, and I emailed Mickey Tripathi this week to say, like, "Hey, ONC annual conference is coming up. Can I make? Can we make a T-shirt or a statement saying they are now real?" <laughs> I'm a, a friendship bracelet. I'm still waiting to hear back. Yep, and I even have uh, this <laughs> friendship bracelet. It says Cubans with hearts somewhere, you know, more appropriate than not, that we'll be handing these out at Health in Vegas next week. So Amazing. just trying to like make the conversation uh, more approachable and interesting so that there's a dialogue. And if someone says that TEFA is going to solve all of your public health problems today, that is not true, but maybe in the future, you know, I think that there are maybe things in the that future about now related. To yeah. Yeah, what would that future, and future look like? Future of health Lisa? data. The future of health data. So I would just say, first of all, like the government owes you a big check for this one because this is amazing marketing, <laughs> like a gonzo marketing campaign for like a not very cool idea. Like the like the idea itself is cool. Like the things we could do are cool, but the actual like Q hens are not cool, right? And so you have almost single handedly, with the help of your friends here, like made this interesting and cool. And that is the hallmark of a great communicator. So bravo to you. And they owe you a big fat check, maybe like a discount on your taxes. That'd be great. I'm sure. Um, because you did some real work for them here. This is interesting. It is funny. It is relevant. And people pay attention. They owe you money. Get your money. And also That's in I case think. anyone from the I'll, federal I'll, government I'll is Listening to our talk show. I don't know if you heard. Carrie is still waiting for a reply from Mickey Tripathi. I don't know. So we just need to know if she can make friendship bracelets. Like when we can make the friendship bracelets. So I don't oh, know. Cool. I don't know. We did, but so shout cool. out the Sequoia Project. Yeah. We saw on their agenda today. I think Brittany found it um, that they have a Q hens aren't real yet uh, a agenda item. So that's very exciting. Very exciting that, uh, wow. you know, wow. we're doing the thing. Carrie, very any other conspiracies? What conspiracy, any other conspiracies any other that are found? You, you know, we went down the rabbit hole with birds aren't real, you know, in general, they are real, but prove to me that they aren't, you know, and then digging deep into that dinosaurs aren't real, but in related to the, the latest conspiracy theories, I think they all are related to the government shutdown. You know, is this just part of a bigger plan or not? And I'm obviously thrilled as a American to, to, to have the government continue. I know it's, it's hard and you've got to come to some consensus, but you know, at this day and age, it's, it's ridiculous to not have a functioning open government and have to Truth. do it every, every year. Straight facts. Yeah. <laughs> as as my as my fifteen facts. as my fifteen year old uh, niece would say, uh, all cap. Straight facts, no cap. Yeah. There we go. 
Straight facts, <laughs> no cap. I got it. She cringed right. like huge. Le- yesterday, there was like the massive cringe fest while I was like trying to speak like a 15 year old. All the, the teenagers were like rolling their eyes at me. <laughs> Straight facts, no cap. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. But I want to. I want to open an invitation. If you have a conspiracy th- theory about health tech or government, send me that idea or message on LinkedIn because I want to get to the bottom right. of all of them. I want to be the myth buster <laughs> of health tech. <laughs> so open call for that. And the weirder, the better. So <laughs> that's my point. All right. So, okay. um, Kat, you have disappeared from the video screen. Is that your intention? We don't see you anymore. Oh, you are no, not, I just screwed you it are up. not streaming. No, well, here, well, we're going to, well, Kira, you can, you can stick around here. We're going to, we're going to switch to mushrooms. Mushrooms. See, I, mushrooms. guys, I don't really know what I'm doing. I let, let me like disclaimer for everybody. So, you know, Lisa and I don't know how to do TV shows and we bought this thing yeah, yeah, yeah. and we could, it's a budget operation. So we could only afford one seat and it's my seat. So like, that's why it's screwed up all the time. Welcome to the, Dr. Natanya Wachtel, uh, who is, uh, I don't, I feel like Natanya, you should just introduce yourself because you do so many things. Okay. Thank you for having me. I, I love this didactic, everything, the conspiracy theories, everything. There's a lot to unpack. I feel like my thing is kind of nerdy, but it's about something funky. So maybe it's that intersection of like nerd is cool now, which I'm, I'm so happy about because I've been a nerd a long time. So whatever I do stuff, but, um, I'm really excited, like evangelical level excited about some developments coming from old school pharma in sort of the mental wellness longevity space with psilocybin. And full disclosure, this is being recorded. I'm gonna say I myself was trepidatious about being public about my interest for a little while because in the same was for um, medical cannabis because I didn't really know anything Mm -hmm. about it, but I thought it was cool. But I also thought, oh, their stigma or I'll be seen as someone into drugs and, you know, but I'm like, I am into drugs. I was launching some Balto. That's a drug, you know? So it's really silly to me <laughs> that, or um, maybe this isn't a good example, but like my mom pretty much on her deathbed um, had like, you know, 17 pill bottles to help her with like extreme stomach pains and nausea, whatever. It's an oncology situation, right? My sister brought her some THC is legal. And my mom's like, I don't do drugs. And we're like, you're doing seven. Like, you're doing drugs. <laughs> yeah. you're doing drugs. This is natural. It'll maybe it'll help your st- feel better. And you won't not even need some of those just to be more comfortable. And, nice. you know, it was sad, but for one week she was super chill. It was the last week, but she was super chill. So, you know, it kind of had, that was the way I came into it. And also thinking like, it's not my area of expertise, so I should not say anything. But I'm Mm. the nerd thing, you know, voracious reader and started to go down, pun intended, I don't know, the rabbit hole, um, especially because of the conference. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But also I was a nervous Nelly because I was afraid to take it myself, Um, Mm -hmm. which kind of seems like hypocritical, but. I've always been really sensitive to anything, again, drugs, uh, over-the-counter medication, cold medication, right? So I was just like, this is amazing. But I was launching a drug um, or helping helping work on a drug for PTSD. It was a first of its kind last year. Oh, wow. And of course, I'm consuming all of this research around PTSD and therapies, and it keeps coming up in all my searches, you know, psilocybin, psilocybin. Then, you know, I couldn't help looking because of my interest in mental wellness or whole person health. I also see longevity, all this stuff. And I'm like, this is legit. And then essentially, I guess I was just on the cusp of, again, now nerds are cool. Mushrooms are now cool. Like if you go into any store, there's like, and my kids know I love it. So now I have like mushroom pocketbooks and notebooks and everything. So it's getting pretty (laughs) mainstream. And I, interestingly enough, you know, the red mushroom with the white dots is poisonous typically so that's just funny to me that that's the one you mean like the the, like the image that you see everywhere yeah sure absolutely basically i'll say this i was gonna share five quick facts if i could because i thought they were kind of please that's like very organized go for it amazing oh i'm the nerd (laughs) 
I have like a little thing. So, <laughs> I love okay. it. So first of all, I'm assuming your audience knows, and some people were shocked to know that mushrooms are not plants. They are fungi, and fungi is an actual distinct category. Were you uh, sorry, have you seen The Last of Us? They're alive, obviously, as we know. <laughs> well, okay, right? So, so psilocybin <laughs> is sort of like a, a category that's kind of sit, called magic mushrooms colloquially, right? We all know that because of the, yes. the chemicals within them, they have these psychoactive agents and they can induce a euphoria, a euphoric rush and potentially hallucinations. Although that's at the, do, the dosing is a, is a thing there. So let's just keep that, you know, for the next, for the facts, which are fun. Okay. So many religious, many cultures for hundreds of years, there are theories about, um, it's a little bit, uh, pedantic called the stoned ape about how we actually evolved our brain with the occipital bun, that bump in the back of your head Whoa. that grew in an exponential amount of time in terms of evolution averages around the time when our ancestors, homo habilis habilis, whatever, were walking through an area where there was a lot of mushroom infused dung. Hmm. Anyway, they ate a lot of them and the brains grew. And also, you know, the perception changes. And all of a sudden there was a aggressive tool building, um, culture and community changed in the way people like lived and partnered and, and had animals for domesticate. All that happened around the time that they started eating the psilocybin. It's not a one-to-one -one thing. It's not a perfect story, but it's pretty cool. Anyway, so outside of like the hippie stuff, right? So there's a lot of treatment and a lot of study now about how mushrooms, or psilocybin specifically in a category, and there's several of these kinds of, of that, but can actually help with anxiety and depression and trauma. Mm. And the reason that matters is unlike alcohol, sorry, y'all, because I don't drink, I eat my calories. Um, the, <laughs> it is the only thing you can put in your body, not THC even, not to, that, that actually stimulates and grows Neuro, neurons and neural networks. It's actually feeding you because, well, you know, it rot, it helps you rot when you die and it also feeds you at, at a cellular level. And so I just find that incredible as, as a brain nerd, right? You were saying about the brain thing. Of course, I wrote that down. Yeah, of course. Hidden Brain, amazing podcast. Yes. Hidden Brain. Okay. So legally, Magic mushroom psilocybin is only legal as a treatment in some states right now. So the government stuff. Oregon. And what's the other one? It's Oregon and somewhere else. Um, not California, I think. N no, and not New Jersey. Well, they're, I'm in New oh, Jersey. Yeah. They're working on it. I believe New York. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's. so. Is it Colorado? Did they decriminalize uh, Colorado? Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. 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 Carrie's, yeah. Carrie's yeah. telling us Colorado. That makes sense. Uh, Carrie you. knows. I'm she knows. I actually did know that. I'm just like. Ah. So um, the thing is you know, because there is the hallucinogenic effect, although there's a right. hallucinogenic effect if in, um, you know, you have a surgery and you get a cocoa, whatever, right? You can, I'll just save my issues. Absolutely. Of that. It's not the drug, it's how you use it. But because of the fact that in, you know, the time of, you know, when LSD and all that stuff and Timothy Leary and the war on drugs, it got really outlawed. Right. And it was, there was trials back then with John Hopkins, with major institutions looking right. at right. how this can help people. And a singular dose in a singular session with a clinician involved, meaning there is a therapeutic aspect of dealing with the trauma with almost like CBT, right. you know, with words, talking about working it through. But because your mind is now ready, your receptors are ready to kind of forge a new path, it's kind of like getting you a new OS. And for someone, you know, a soldier who's had 10 years of restless nights with nightmares, um, trigger responses to any loud noise, you know, just horrible existence to have one night take this thing have a weird experience with their doctor that guides them through address their trauma face it wait finish and go the next day be able to sleep through the night and feel like a complete they said like a complete lifting of the trauma hmm. wouldn't we want to figure that out like i don't get it but yeah. you know talk about that's the thing is about the money that's another thing right like who makes money on it and all that, that and just so everybody knows well, uh, Natanya is a former pharmaceutical marketing vigilante <laughs> she yeah. has yeah. she has joined the other side <laughs> well, so so what well, i would say on, like, what i would I, say I, about I, all of this though so, oh, sorry no what i would say about this is that obviously you know we're just dealing with a huge amount of um you know 
very pointless slash potentially connected to the direction of pharmaceutical drug development and approvals. Um, you know, backlash against a, cla a class or a couple of classes of drugs or medicines that obviously should be explored further. The problem I have with this is that, well, just like with cannabis, it, you know, it, it would be, there are plenty of pharmaceutical companies that could easily, you know, convert and start to use elements of psilocybin and already have started to use different types of cannabis, THC, CBD, all of the others in drug development, in therapeutics development, you know, it doesn't make any sense, right? If, if there's something there, there's no reason to have some weird stigma against it. I understand they're in these classes of drugs. It doesn't make sense. They obviously have enough evidence to show that like these drugs or these elements of drugs can be used in, you know, legitimate therapeutic purposes. So why block it? It's long overdue in this country for cannabis to be approved for usage like this across at a federal level, not just at the state level, at many states level. Same thing for psilocybin. It's the same idea. I, I don't I truly don't understand it. It's a weird thing to block ourselves from doing clearly. Yeah. And the yeah. thing I wanted to, in my five facts, so the big fact is coming, right? No, that it's not. Okay, big fact. Most, I mean, I don't know who's listening, but in my experience, most of us have either currently or in the past or in the future, will have some challenge in a mental health way. It doesn't have to be, you know, bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder, but something where you might need to work through some stuff to get to being okay. So that's what is like, it's sort of known for the frontier, which, you know, is what we were just talking about. But regardless, if you don't have some stuff in general, because of that neural stimulation, that cellular regeneration, and then ne those neurons wanting to grow and make new connections, which essentially is more like brain power, they basically boost memory for anyone. And so that's where like, I think, and we talk about microdosing and microdosing is, again, not to be too technical, there's a medical dose, which is an amount that does give you like, and I've personally not done that. I'm not ready for that personally because of my other stuff, but I'm like trying to put a toe in the water. But I have sure. um, been reading about and have colleagues and clinicians and some who left their traditional practice because they were so inspired, honestly, by what it did for their patients. But then there's all these other tests. They're looking in Alzheimer's and dementia, which again, if you don't even have Alzheimer's and dementia, if you're like, you know, aging as some of us are, you know, you're, you're thinking about your memory and your function and your recall. And right. so this is basically like a boost to that. And at a microdose level, most people, um, a microdose, you know, again, there's a range here, but around 250, like the smallest amount, you don't feel high. You're not going to have visual experiences and that kind of thing, but you are ingesting a bit of mushrooms that, and some people right. feel something and some people don't at that level. But the point is you're, the receptors are now on for that. So it's what, you know, what you put in. So anyone, I'm like the evangelical, all of us should take the mushrooms, but really, and you remember <laughs> everything from this show. No, but um, it's a great way. So it's I feel like it couldn't be like, like probably on balance, it would be fine if everyone did. <laughs> But keep going. I mean, no. so, I mean, if you want the nerdy part, it, it basically boosts brain activity. Okay. It synchronizes that right. neural connectivity in basically unconnected areas. After, so as our brains develop, as we age around 24, the brain starts to kind of like get solidly in its way at 36, you're pretty much set in terms of like your automatic processing and who you are and the person that you are. But that doesn't mean it can't change. And the thing that's so great about mushrooms is there is a response, this, this, you know, neural connectivity in octogenarian, in 80 year olds. So you don't, you know, at mm. any age, you can effectively have cellular response that is like a young person. How cool is that? If that's not the foundation. Seems youth, reasonable. I mean, I'm talking to you, Reishi. That's another mushroom. It's not psychedelic, but I think mushrooms in general have a lot of potential. And we're just now using our Western tools and clinical endpoints to kind of validate what other cultures have been like, yeah, duh for hundreds of years, right? The folks who live the well, so, but, but Can you talk about the health tech implications? Because I know there are a number of companies in the psychedelic tech space. I have been familiar with Ozmind for, I don't know, that's, is that you see the name, Ozmind? I don't know. Um, and there's a couple others like that. Any of you are watching in the health tech space? That's a great That are using great. psychedelics? So there, there's a couple things here because of the legal issues. And again, this is to me sure. follows a little bit the arc of the cannabis story mm. um in terms totally. of you know 
in certain areas, you can be really public. I know for in certain areas, there are clinicians who do, and it feels kind of like, um, not culty, but like this underground invite only situation where they right. will do treatments with people and it's like cash pay or free uh, mm. so that people can get treatment. And sometimes we're talking about terminal cancer patients who take wow. this to help with facing their death. Okay. So like, it's ridiculous that they're not allowed in whatever state they live in, but that's why. On the digital side, to me, again, this is an uninformed personal opinion, like I'm an amateur here. So just want to put that disclaimer out there. You know, it's a combination in terms of actual health effect that is about mental well being. Aside from the things like just longevity, you need the other pieces like the talking part or the workshopping part. Right. Like the, all the structure and the, the, structure the, every, the, the therapist, like, and the structure. It's the basically tools, like yeah. a supercharged therapy session, right? But it also is more open-ended with more possibility development, more like resilience, right. growth mindset type of stuff, but forcing yourself to imagine the worst scenario, the best, scenario, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I believe that digital tools personally can be a way for people to potentially microdose or dose at home who have maybe gone through some criterion because there's a there's not enough there are not enough practitioners most of the places are full of and or like in, like in everything in behavioral health right there's so that's what i think i think it can be a com combination mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as just like you know it works if you work it or remote monitoring rpm ccm potentially like maybe not maybe the sessions are mm -hmm. with the patient but you have it as right. part of it and and you know as of now because of the legalities most of the other kind of block and tackle mental health groups are kind of like, we're not touching that, you know? So, so yeah. they're interesting they're standalone, but my hope is there's a little more integration because back to the whole, we are one body system, not just a bits of parts, you know? Yeah. Love yeah. that. And the so same issues apply. The same issues apply also the health data issues, Kat. This is also the same thing, right? Tie okay, it back so to health data. You want to do that. You want to do this because you're like, I have PTSD or I have some other serious trauma and there's an opportunity here, might be legal in your state. But of course, you don't want to do it in a way where your health data is going to be captured and then shared. Just the same with any other sort of sensitive health data issue. I was just talking, in fact, on that stage last week and got a question from behavioral health providers about you know the ability of health data utilities to appropriately manage behavioral health data. And I said, here's the challenge. And I don't want to understate it. I want us to not have stigma around behavioral health and behavioral health data. But at the same time, it's very naive to say, well, it's fine, like just do it. And um, it doesn't matter if someone knows that you are in treatment, in ketamine treatment, ketamine therapy treatment, or in psilocybin therapy treatment for PTSD. You know, there are very real legal issues there for people still today. So right. it's really tricky and it really brings that issue up to the forefront as well around how we deal with behavioral health data. So it's absolutely. really interesting. absolutely, I, I, and that's I'm watching I, it, and that's why I'm sort of not expecting the 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 moon on a plate here. But you know, like I'm going to my first like woo woo. I actually was like, cat. I think I'm going all in on the mushroom thing. I'm just like feeling like the tub. <laughs> I texted her. Nice. Like, you, ten, the, you know, what's the name of the conference? Wonderland. The of Wonderland. Listen, Wonderland. That is a name. That is a name. I'm into that. That is and, name. and it's like a real conference, you know, <laughs> like it's a real medical, like the CEO of Cerebral stuff, you know, like it's real, but it's, it's nice. very avant-garde and it's, it's about, you know, all psychedelics, which I only really have been lo looking in psilocybin myself personally and mushrooms for other things because I also turkey tail and oncology and that kind of stuff. So to me, it's like fungi, mm -hmm. become a fungi worshiper. And that's partly because I, you know, cats always posting cute pictures of her with her mushroom foraging. So I was like, hey, guess what? Follow me on Instagram, at Kat McDavid. Lots yeah. of mushroom pictures. Uh, I'm, so not, I'm not pictures. tripping on any mushrooms in these photos, but I Right, I mean, them. but that's the, even that I always say that too. And I'm like, well, I've never done a medical dose. Like, well, who cares if I have? I just, and you know, and I feel sort of hypocritical. And when I went to try to do my micro dose, I waited till all of my children were in camp, like no one was home for days. And I like had friends and I meant, and a, like a doctor friend, like, like, 
Like in the movies where the girl is like getting ready to lose her virginity and she wants it perfect. Oh, Jesus Christ. With petals on the bed. Like I had to do that because I was so afraid. Like how will I react? And oh, it was it was fine. Oh, my God. And it was amazing. And, you know, I, I chose something really simple at first. It was a, a language I wanted to get um, further well, I was already already fluent in, but I wanted it to flow more naturally. And um, I decided to grab all of the books I had in my house, which also was like a cookbook and like random things in that language. So I read all that and I went to sleep Perfect. and I woke up and it was like fluid. And I had a microphone. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Hold on. I got it. We got a few questions. It's hard because I got to read over on the LinkedIn. So a couple things. So Nadine uh, made a comment. <laughs> There's that... no way to follow this. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's so... It's... Carrie. Uh, so it's Nadine fine. is yeah, saying we, that uh, mushrooms are being used for alcohol use disorder treatment. This is very yes. cool. Melissa yeah. noted that New Jersey, Natanya, your your uh, home state, has locations that allow you to do it under observation. Very yes. cool. Very progressive. Yes. Pretty sure mm. in red state Georgia, we're not doing mushrooms yet, but like, you know, like maybe in 40 years. I don't so know. they bind to uh, those serotonin receptors. And that's why, because a lot of, a lot of abu uh, substance use disorder and I'm lumping together alcohol, opioid, even cigarettes, like anything that's a compulsory calming, um, this, the serotonin receptor binding, it's like chills you out, right? Basically. And yeah. then you don't have that impulse to like, uh, like that. I mean, that is the, that you like that, that was science, right? There. I love, listen, I love science. Everybody knows that. <laughs> very, oh, I'm very practical. I love practical me. things. Okay, hold on. Uh, Grace noted she's a huge advocate for use of mushrooms in oncology and end of life care. Uh, and then one question from one of our speakers, Carrie, who benefits from limiting access to mushroom therapy? And then we'll switch to climate. Yeah. After so just answers. really quickly, I think I think you you said it, Lisa. You know, really well when you're talking about the the far so pharma in the loop. How does it work? So. I say this and it's really respectfully to big pharma because I still have friends and work. <laughs> and friends and clients. <laughs> Paychecks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone would argue with a, this statement, which is the treatments, the pharmaceutical treatments that we have today for mental health do not treat the condition. They help manage no. the person. Yes to yep. function in our society. So they might dampen some of the extreme mania or mood swings or help boost you so you can get out of bed and take a shower, but they don't actually cure you or help you go past it really. Yeah. Like they help you go through the motions that you then, and that's why there's also often combative or combinative care with, with other kinds of things and even things like forest bathing and whatever, in addition to, to all kinds of therapy. Or, or tapping or cognitive or whatever. So I think, I think instead of looking at it as competition, it should be looked at as adjunctive, right? Or, or, or like a family of, of products that you can use together in different ways. And maybe for someone who is not able to be, let's say, stable in their life, like daily function, getting out of bed, talking with people, doing a job if you have it, caring for people if you have children or whatever you have to do that you can't do. So if you need a medication to help make sure you can do that, that is a compound, I'm not saying don't take that personally. But I think if you want to heal your trauma, if you want to feed your cells with something that wants to eat the bad stuff away and help you be vibrant, then psilocybin can be additive and it can be used in conjunction. But right now, pharma is worried because a lot of this data kind of makes it seem like, well, then you don't need your SSRIs or you don't need those things. And I think it's a little bit right. there as well as the cost right now. I mean, you can, they can be grown by anyone. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of dosing required to have a very profound impact. So it might be one dose forever, like one treatment. It could be one treatment every six months, depending on, again, what's going on with the person. So I think that's where we have this sort of battlefield and also stigma, well, like you said. said. Yeah. yeah. Stigma. But I, I would say it, it's actually going back to health tech again, right? It's, it's, there's also a, 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 you can also compare it to the situation happening with the GLP-1 inhibitors, with the Ozempic-like drugs. You know, of course, someone can just take the drug, but 
it's much better and much and more likely to be covered by employers and health insurers if you're doing it as part of a program that's most often these days like health tech enabled right yep. where you have something where you have uh, you have remote providers or you have remote monitoring you have something that supports that health coaching just drug on its health coaching whatever it is and usually those are technology enabled or delivered it's not like yep hard health tech, it's like technology enablement platforms for these kind of clinical delivery in certain areas. Same thing for this, right? I think they should really think about what it takes to deliver an entire therapeutic regimen and not be so focused just on the compounds or whatever it is and really lean into that as we get more into personalized medicine, as we get more into different modalities of treatment and things like that. So I'm excited. I love it. And um, thanks for sharing with us. It's so yeah. great. Thank you. I hope I wasn't boring. Natanya is all over the LinkedIn. So just go like message her, <laughs> yeah. do all the okay, things. Oh, so. I had one last fact because it's again, not for, if it's not for mental health, so anybody can boost your brain as well as there are studies now about athletic performance, which is really cool. I think in an area, nice. again, unusual, throwing it out there. So whatever you're into, we love have it. a much for that. Awesome. Thanks, Natanya. Okay. All right. Thanks, Natanya. Right. What do we got going on here? All right. All right. Okay. All this right. is exciting. Right. New special All guest. Right. New special guest. All right. So we have Marie Kopoulos. Am I saying that correctly? Oh, thank you God. Close. All right. Kopoulos. So Marie's basically Kopoulos. a hero in health technology. She was like the CEO of Comagine. She ran Health Catalyst yeah. last time I checked. She was a city <laughs> block doing data stuff. Um, but she's been super interested in the intersection of climate and healthcare. And I was joking about this earlier. She sent me an op-ed like maybe last year, the year before that you wrote for uh, uh, the healthcare blog, Marie. And I was like, whoa, I'm in the South. Like we don't have climate change. What is this <laughs> op-ed even about? Like what is going on? But it was like, oh, it made me you. think, right? I was like, oh, like maybe this is the thing we should care about. And Marie, more and more, you've been sending me things over the past, uh, well, past year, I think like, oh, look, like the government's doing a thing with climate and health and all this stuff. So. Um, you know, for other red state uh, citizens, we would like for you to tell us about the fact that climate change is real and it does impact our health. And just tell us some things. Introduce yourself. Do all the yeah. stuff. I, so nice to nice to be here um, for both Kat and Lisa. I, this started off like in a very unscientific way, which was like if you've worked in healthcare data and strategy for a long time, I feel like you build these spidey senses where you're like pattern recognition that's probably going to hit me and like they're going to try to do something that I don't right. have to do. Um, and I started feeling that and was like, what is happening here? Um, I spent my career in alternative payment models and data, right? So like on the cutting edge of things that we try to do where like we didn't have good data to do it. Um, and climate just started to feel like one of those things. Um, and so like at the highest framing level, you know, there's like two big discourses. How do we mitigate? You know, the health sector is 8.5% of the domestic emissions, which who knew? Um, and then how do we adapt? 8.5? You know? Yeah, it's big. Of all the emissions in the country are coming from healthcare waste and healthcare, like whatever, yeah. manufacturing, hospitals, delivery, all the garbage, all the things that they can't, they have to put in special packages, single use, all those things, right? Mm. It, exactly. Um, and then on the flip side of that, you know, when we look at the impacts of like a heat wave or air quality, um, the, the statistics are sort of shocking. As somebody who thinks about managing high risk populations, um, you know, like we're looking at things like, you know, adding a very small amount of air pollution reduces life expectancy by a year and hits you know, chronic kidney disease, COPD, cardiovascular disease, all of these conditions that like we're hyper-focused on in the context of these arrangements. And so the other segment of discourses around how do we adapt, right? Like this is happening right now. Anything we do to mitigate isn't right. really going to help us right now. And so if we believe that like we care about climate because it impacts our health fundamentally and probably the communities that have already been underserved in many ways, like that's happening right now. Um, and so I think the question is, you know, both from a health tech and data community perspective, how can we help, but also like what mandate are we going to get hit with that um, we're going to have mm. to figure out, which is I think actually probably going to happen first um, as we start to look at just like how some things, some things are shaking out. And so Marie, yeah, yeah that's right. super, that's, that's super interesting. Go ahead, yeah, you two, you two are going to get along on this. You know, I'm just going to have to be like, I 
you know. Um, but so Marie, earlier today when we were talking about you coming on the show, because you know, um, you know, like I said, we're mostly winging it over here. Uh, you were talking about uh, you listened to our last episode to get inspiration. I'm sure because it was so good. Uh, it was so good. <laughs> but but we were talking about trash data, right? And you were like, oh my gosh, the trash data concept like totally plays here. So tell us about that. Tell us about trash data. Man, trash data. I, I could talk oh about God. trash data in every conversation. Um, so I think just to connect some dots, right? Like right now, the big source of conversation globally is around emissions reporting. And it's probably going <laughs> to, you know, there's ways that it could hit healthcare. The Joint Commission has a voluntary certification program. The SEC is talking about regulation that would hit publicly held companies. But in California, which likes to be out in front, um, they have very aggressive um, sort of like legislation moving through right now that if signed would require reporting um, on scope one, two, and three emissions, which is like oh, wow. things in your control, but also things outside your control um, for both public and private companies and um, over a billion dollars in revenue, which is like most health systems in California. Right, of course. And so if something like that comes to bear, right, like you start to ask the question, where's that data going to come from? Right. Like, um, and, and so I think that's the connection, right? Suddenly we're probably about to see the emergence of pretty big reporting requirements. Um, and, and I think that will inevitably flow downstream, right, to data folks within the healthcare industry to say, like, if, if 80 percent. We've got to find a way to report this. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever. 80, report something. Yeah. If 80 percent of emissions come from the healthcare supply chain. You know, we, we all know how good that data is. Wow. Well, so one of the things I like to rant about and I found out more about recently is just in that space of reporting and requirements is, of course, the uh, the carbon offset industry scam. By the way, it's a scam. In case you didn't know, carbon offsets are a scam. I'm sorry if they are your firstborn child, but they are a total scam. <laughs> and no, a complete <laughs> fake scam, like buying like uh, farms in New Zealand and planting trees on them and stopping people from having farms in New Zealand. And instead you have like a tree, uh, like a, a forest, a new forest you promise you will never cut. And then selling that in a weird, like fake certificate scam to big companies who have promised that they will cut their carbon climate, emissions. Climate it's carbon totally, credits aren't real. No, they're not <laughs> real. That's a, that, that's a, that's a climate tech conspiracy. That's totally real. Carrie, take me up on this one. Um, <laughs> But here's the fun thing I just learned. So you know that all of these automakers have agreed to cut their emissions. The way that they're doing it is by buying carbon offset credits from Tesla, who manufacture EVs, and they just buy like for billions of dollars a year carbon offset credits from Tesla and then say that they are like green automakers. It's a huge scam. I have no doubt that if there's more pressure on the healthcare industry, Marie, that it's going to be exactly the same nonsense. You know, they're just going to copy paste. And by the way, cat, we can make a ton of money by creating a fake sort of like carbon offset thing for healthcare. Everyone, we're going to start a new business. It's carbon offsets for healthcare. You heard it here first. We're oh going to totally God. plant some trees. <laughs> And I love credit starting businesses. We Done. should do it right now. What state would <laughs> we should you do? It. Is it a We're nonprofit? Doing it. We're doing it. For it. Oh profit? my God. What are we doing? What are we, we got to call Sam? California, right here. Well, I will start, start the business today. We're not I'm starting any Sam. businesses. Have I'm you tried to start a business in California? It is not a place where we're going to start okay, a business. Fine. Fine. Delaware. Arizona. Arizona. <laughs> Arizona. Okay. Where? figure it out if somebody's gonna figure it out you will figure it out so okay. oh my god okay all right all right more, more questions for marie so marie you uh you know some you know i don't think a lot of things are real but you've been sending me some stuff and so you sent me uh a framework from the feds well, hold on i actually Ooh. like had it pulled up here all right all right and Ooh. you said this looks actually legit and has some meat on it it's the national climate oh. resilience framework is this real okay it appears to be real. There's a PDF document that everyone can click into. It came out last week. Um, nice. Yeah. So th this is on the other side, right? We talked about mitigation. What if suddenly we started measuring this in healthcare? Like what right. we're doing. The other side of it is adaptation. And um, the White House just like uh, last week put out this plan, six point plan that says like, here's our national strategy for how we are going to build a more resilient nation. And health is explicitly and implicitly all over it. And so is data in interesting ways. If you sort of like go through and read between the lines, 
Um, so I think it's interesting because I think as a healthcare industry, we tend to be so like focused on ourselves, mm. right? Like we're used to like, here's the health legislation and let's like say what Big it means problems. to us. And in the climate discussion, right? Like we're sort of off to the side, you know? And it's like, we're threaded through it and there's really important implications, but that's been very interesting to sort of sit on the sidelines of. Um, but what I would say is, right, like lots of data, right? Like going into how do we know what communities are at risk? And, um, you know, so there's a 14 agency body coming together to look at this, to say, like, how do we close gaps, right, in our understanding? And when I hear that, I say, hey, it sounds like a lot like things we care about related to public health infrastructure is health at the table, right, as, as some of those. Oh, yeah. It's exactly mm. the same. And by the yeah. way, I could save them a lot of money. I could just give them the current, like, you know, like disparity areas. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a 99.99999% fit. Like I'm pretty positively sure it's the same thing. They could just save the money, go to those places and work on climate issues there. I mean, I can just tell you from living in Baltimore city to living in Marin County, California, the amount of black soot on my windowsill is significantly lower. And I'm pretty sure that that's a climate and, you know, pollution effect that is like very directly harming people's health. And you just have to go out there and look at those disparity areas. I'm sure it's the exact same thing. Yeah. And in fairness, like there's some great maps um, coming out of the environmental justice community. And there's yeah. like, so health, climate, equity tend to all converge. And there, and so these maps totally. are amazing, right? And they sort of nice. point to hotspots where you would say, hey, like we really should be right now focusing efforts on mitigation. Um, and I think the question is like, what role do hospitals, health systems, insurers play? Mm. In that? Um, mm. And I think earn that commu- those community benefit dollars should go to something, and maybe yeah. they could go to mitigating climate in- inequities. Just a thought. So, like, wait, so I have like I have like a question, but we have an audience question. So um, oh. what you guys are talking about with maps? So Susan Clark, health IT rock star, congratulations again, Susan, on your lady boss job with direct trust. <laughs> uh, she says or asks, does Marie have data on migration of people due to deteriorating habitable living conditions and impact from that population movement? Uh, not right now, but there are people <laughs> who look at that. It's a really important question, right? Like, hey, there's a wildflower, you, wildfire. You're displaced because of like your home is on a cliff that is crashing into the sea, like populations move or like, and, and and what happens? Does that overwhelm the healthcare system? Do those people have housing? Um, so I think there's all these multifaceted ways. And Susan, like I will dig up some data and send it your way so you can take a look. Like nice. that often hits squarely in mental health impacts, overwhelm capacity. But I think the, the key thing for me is like, there's no way for our health systems not to be on the front lines of this, right? Like as as communities become more volatile. And I think like, how are we part of those conversations is a big question. Are we using that data? Are we getting the dollars? Um, it, it's sort of for me, like, you know, increasingly gonna become more presence. Um, who are gonna be the resilience hubs in these White House plans where they're pouring dollars into community, like sort of folks in the community to say like, you will be the place people mm. go. And it just seems like a natural fit for healthcare. And yet yeah. somehow, it's- feel like we're not talking about it as much as we should be. That's amazing. So, Kat, how did we get two like extremely qualified guests with our like extreme lack of preparation? Amazing. I'm totally winging it. I, I think we just know people who are smarter. <laughs> 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 and we, we just let it Weird. roll. But yeah, so Marie, like, you know, despite the fact that I live in a state where we neither had a pandemic nor climate change, um, like, so, but I'm into this, like I'm into this and I'm always thinking about the path to revenue, right? That's, that's what I'm good at. So like, at, like, what is it going to take? Like, what's it going to take to like make this flip and convert into something that we're all caring about? You said it's just going it, to, it'll just be put upon us, but like, what do you, what do you think? Like, what's the path forward or how can, how can we all have a part in it and making it happen? Yeah. So two things, right? I think, I think from a regulatory perspective, the emissions reporting is just going to like hit us. Mm. Right. And if you're in California, it's probably going to happen sooner than later. And if you're everywhere else, that's the question is like, Hey, do you want to start working on this now? Or are you going to wait? Um, so I think that's thing number one. Like, I think there'll be regulatory requirements that come down on that one. Um, and it's a question of where you want to be on that curve. And then on the adaptation side, I think, I think the challenge and opportunity for healthcare organizations is there are a lot of dollars like coming down the pipeline for resilience. And then the question Mm. is, how as a healthcare organization, do you bring yourself into that conversation, right? So you can be a resilience hub. 
So you can be part of that. You can be benefiting from those dollars and benefiting your community, right? Um, I think it doesn't look yet, right? Like these are things that are just like, here's a healthcare specific program, right? But there's lots of ways to jump in and say, hey, I wanna be part of the conversation. And I think that's important for us as an industry. Yeah, and also yeah. I remember that um, John Doerr and I think some of his uh, pals at Kleiner Perkins, maybe about a year ago, first announced that they were really going to go in very, very specifically on climate tech investing. I know that he, I think the first thing that he did was fund a new school at Stanford, which is not my idea of going all, like, all in on climate investing, but I'm still going to give him a chance. We can John agree does care to disagree. About this. We just talked about that. We just talked, we can have all That's true. That's true. Here. I, John Doerr can I, have I, a I do. school. It's cool. Capital is headed in that direction. It has to be, right? Like you just said, Marie, it's 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 the it's accelerating very, very quickly. All that I can think about when we think about climate and health and technology is that kind of weird Apple TV plus show extrapolations. Did you see it? If not, it is no. no. What's in, the name? In extra it's it's called extrapolations. It is very traumatic if you are worried about the future of the planet, because it is like a very like you know, a, a, a sort of semi positive, negative view of what can happen very, very soon. And in that show, there's a disease called summer heart. And you can imagine that is the, you know, the people being born in a planet that is much warmer than, you know, their little, little DNA came from, and sort of what happens there. So that's a that's my that's my, uh, my, maybe entertainment, maybe nightmare recommendation for um, a uh, fictionalized take on the future here. It sounds like summer heart. like perfect Friday summer heart. Afternoon. Friday afternoon, that. summer heart. I'm not gonna watch that. I can't even watch the rest of us or whatever. I can't watch any of that. The stuff. Last of Us. Yeah. That one's very. Well, that's hard to watch. I mean, look, I have I'm not two doing TV it. recommendations for this: The Last of Us and Extrapolations. I am all go. over media. There we go. Check oh my out. gosh! Oh my, my, our, new, <laughs> our, our first sponsors might come rolling in, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> I know. Okay. Come on. Come on, Tim Cook. Right. We're right, right here. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So uh, we're we're almost at our hour. I have one and a half more things to talk about here. So Marie, any any Great. last words? Y'all can find Marie on the LinkedIn too. She also yeah, you should Google Marie. her. She has awesome. she writes many fine pieces of literature about this topic. Nice to see. Thanks, you all. Marie. So Thanks, nice Marie. to see you on on our amazing talk show. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. This is okay, Lisa. Right. We, we don't have a lot of time. So, you know, we were talking about I know, jobs. Right. Um, I didn't actually uh, find any crappy job descriptions, but you noted something interesting, which might actually be intellectually stimulating to talk about. Um, you are a big proponent of posting uh, salary ranges. So I don't know if anyone can actually read yeah. on the slide here, uh, but you mentioned salary we were ranges. talking about. Our, uh, our friend Claudia Williams, and we were talking yep. about how she now comments on LinkedIn posts that are about jobs. And she says, what's, she won't repost to her network unless there's a salary range listed. And right. I want to fight about this. Maybe not fight, like I want to like have a discourse about this. Because right. as a fight. sole business owner, I hate posting salary ranges because I also don't know what I'm going to get. Like, what if I find someone amazing? I might change the job description, but uh, but I do get it. And I think you've made valid uh, yeah. valid arguments to me as to why we have to do this. And Civitas, your organization is also small, but you still we are do. committed to posting do. Uh, transparent salary ranges. So tell me why your, yeah. your opinion is better than mine. Well, we have a budget, right? And also nonprofits are like, first of all, being a nonprofit on the one hand, like we're nonprofit because we're a collaborative and we have members and we do stuff together. And so we, we serve also like a charitable mission as a nonprofit organization. That means that we don't have unlimited budgets, right? And also nonprofits are like kind of historically known for being a little bit exploitative to employees, like people working in mm. full-time jobs for like $35,000 a year, you know, more probably could make more working in a fast food restaurant than working in a nonprofit in some situations. We try to not do it, try to pay at market, but also to be really transparent about where we are. This is the range and we can't go out of it. We try and make it as generous as possible. We don't want to waste anyone's time. You're an applicant. We want you to feel like you know what you're going to get to. We're not going to be, you know, offering you something much higher than that or lower than that. And really just trying to make everybody be on the same level, be equitable, be transparent about pay. Now, for a private sector company, the thing is, like, I think you should still put a range out there. And the reason why I think that, sorry, if you can hear that, it's because the Blue Angels are in San Francisco right now and they are flying around in their jets 
it is the <gasps> first year that there is a woman pilot in one of the it, it sounds the like Angels freedom crew. it's incredible I love it mm. it's amazing they're everywhere <laughs> um <laughs> but i still think you should pose you don't want people to waste their time right you can still go outside of that range like i don't know what like the law says but you can still go outside of that range well, we don't Just have laws in places, georgia like, yeah, true, true, true. So. But just giving people an idea, like not wasting their time, being a job applicant sucks, right? It's like really mm. obnoxious. And so making sure people know what they're getting into is always helpful. So I'm pro as a nonprofit leader, like we will always post ranges. Also, I do live in um, the People's Republic of California. And so um, we probably have to, I think it's the law here. But um, I don't, our business isn't here, but, but we do it anyway. So that's my argument. I say, yes, give them a range. You can go outside of it if you have to. It's fine. Yeah. That's yeah. what well, I think. Well, you'll, you'll be impressed. You have, um, you have moved my position on this. For the past few jobs uh, that we have, the positions we have filled at Incena, we have both provided the range. Uh, nice. And if someone, if we love someone and they wanted more than the range, we actually have waited until we had a more senior position to put them into. So nice. I'm impressed. I do listen sometimes. Quality. Quality. Oh, yeah, like A plus situation. I but I'd it. love to hear what everyone else thinks about um, hosting salary ranges. Again, as an employer, I think it kind of sucks. Like I get why we don't think it's cool. But as an applicant, I also think that that, you know, it depends yeah. on who we're thinking about here. Um, who are you, you know, talking about? The, the, um, the great, the great citizens of the United States of America. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. I have one more thing and that is, um, our, um, your, uh, your, our mutual acquaintance and my mutual friend and longtime collaborator, Emily Peters, um, from Uncommon Bold, um, is releasing a book on the 15th. Mm -hmm. That's going to be next week is the actual release date called Artists Remaking Medicine. It's amazing, not just because I wrote one of the chapters and um, really encourage you to check it out. Beautiful art, really great, you know, stories about different aspects of art and culture sort of impacting what's happening in medicine and vice versa. Um, she's been posting really great stuff every week on LinkedIn about it. So definitely recommend it. Get Artists Remaking Medicine and let us know what you think. Yes. And maybe, maybe she'll be a, maybe she'll be one of our guests. Um, maybe other she last will be thing one of our guests. Have, other last thing we have going on. So Lisa and I are going to health next week along with like basically everybody else. Uh, Lisa is uh, on the board of Zoria Foundation and uh, I'm, I'm like in charge of this one. Uh, we're providing healthcare, we're providing <laughs> childcare grants to uh, speakers and patient partners who are attending. But um, I was planning on like doing a party run about like what, what we're excited about, Lisa, but I, I, like, nice. so, I don't even know if we could talk about it. There's too um, many parties. Yeah, we'll just talk about next week. I think Carrie's going to do a recorded se uh, conspiracy session nice. from the Meow Wolf of Mega Mart. Uh, I don't know what she's got planned. We're going to have to wait and see. Perfect. Um, but I think we should end this episode with how we ended our first inaugural episode. And that is by reading Thomas Novak's horoscope. So oh my God. Um, I, I might okay. not read the whole thing. I might not read the whole thing, but here we go. People will be focused on themselves. Yeah, Lisa and I are very focused on ourselves, Tom. I apologize. Leaving you wondering what all the fuss is about. I don't know. You have a strong desire to express your emotions. It may feel like you're on stage in some way. Well, I don't know. I mean, you're on stage right now. You wish to be recognized and appreciated for your sensitive, devoted, and passionate nature. Speak up. <laughs> nice. Well, I will recognize Tom Nova because he is a great dad. He's a great dad to his human children and his dog children. So I'm recognizing and appreciating him for that. Yeah. God bless Tom Novak. All right. Okay. Yeah. We are done. We this it worked this time. Yay! We did right. it. Uh, see you, Sadie. Hi. See you, half of the industry at health next week. Everyone. Thank you, Natanya. Thank you, great Carrie. Time. Thank you, Marie. You guys are Thanks really smart. You. Love it. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You.